Section Zero of the New Atlantis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The New Atlantis by Francis Bacon. Section Zero. Introductory Note. Bacon's literary executor, Dr. Rowley, published The New Atlantis in 1627, the year after the author's death. It seems to have been written about 1623, during that period of literary activity which followed Bacon's political fall. None of Bacon's writings gives in short space so vivid a picture of his tastes and aspirations as this fragment of the plan of an ideal commonwealth. The generosity and enlightenment, the dignity and splendor, the piety and public spirit of the inhabitants of Bensalem represent the ideal qualities which Bacon the statesman desired rather than hoped to see characteristic of his own country. And in Solomon's house we have Bacon the scientist indulging without restriction his prophetic vision of the future of human knowledge. No reader acquainted in any degree with the processes and results of modern scientific inquiry can fail to be struck by the numerous approximations made by Bacon's imagination to the actual achievements of modern times. The plan and organization of his great college lay down the main lines of the modern research university, and both in pure and applied science he anticipates a strikingly large number of recent inventions and discoveries. In still another way is the New Atlantis typical of Bacon's attitude. In spite of the enthusiastic and broad-minded schemes he laid down for the pursuit of truth, Bacon always had an eye to utility. The advancement of science which he sought was conceived by him as a means to a practical end the increase of man's control over nature, and the comfort and convenience of humanity. For pure metaphysics, or any form of abstract thinking that yielded no fruit, he had little interest, and this leaning to the useful is shown in the practical applications of the discoveries made by the scholars of Solomon's house. Nor does the interest of the work stop here. It contains much, both in its political and in its scientific ideals, that we have as yet by no means achieved, but which contain valuable elements of suggestion and stimulus for the future. End of section zero. Recording by Bill Borst. Section one of the New Atlantis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The New Atlantis by Francis Bacon. Section one. We sailed from Peru where we had continued for the space of one whole year for China and Japan, by the South Sea, taking with us victuals for twelve months, and had good winds from the east, though soft and weak, for five months apace, and more. But the wind came about, and settled in the west for many days, so as we could make little or no way, and were some time in purpose to turn back. But then again there arose strong and great winds from the south with a point east, which carried us up for all that we could do towards the north, by which time our victuals failed us, though we had made good spare of them, so that finding ourselves in the midst of the greatest wilderness of waters in the world, without victuals, we gave ourselves for lost men and prepared for death. Yet we did lift up our hearts and voices to God above, who showeth his wonders in the deep, beseeching him of his mercy, that as in the beginning he discovered the face of the deep, and brought forth dry land, so he would now discover land to us, that we might not perish. And it came to pass that the next day about evening we saw within a kenning before us towards the north, as it were, thick clouds which did put us in some hope of land, knowing how that part of the South Sea was utterly unknown, and might have islands or continents that hitherto were not come to light. Wherefore we bent our course thither, where we saw the appearance of land, all that night, and in the dawning of the next day we might plainly discern that it was a land, flat to our sight, and full of boscage, which made it show the more dark, 
and after an hour and a half's sailing we entered into a good haven, being the port of a fair city, not great indeed, but well built, and that gave a pleasant view from the sea. And we thinking every minute long, till we were on land, came close to the shore, and offered to land. But straightways we saw diverse of the people, with bastons in their hands, as it were, forbidding us to land, yet without any cries of fierceness, but only as warning us off, by signs that they made. Whereupon, being not a little discomforted, we were advising with ourselves what we should do. During which time there made forth to us a small boat with about eight persons in it, whereof one of them had in his hand a tipstaff of a yellow cane, tipped at both ends with blue, who came aboard our ship, without any show of distrust at all. And when he saw one of our number present himself somewhat before the rest, he drew forth a little scroll of parchment somewhat yellower than our parchment, and shining like the leaves of writing-tables, but otherwise soft and flexible, and delivered it to our foremost man, in which scroll were written, in ancient Hebrew, and in ancient Greek, and in good Latin of the school, and in Spanish, these words, Land ye not, none of you, and provide to be gone from this coast within sixteen days, except you have further time given you. Meanwhile, if you want fresh water or victuals, or help for your sick, or that your ship needeth repairs, write down your wants, and you shall have that which belongeth to mercy. This scroll was signed with a stamp of cherubim, wings not spread, but hanging downwards, and by them a cross. This being delivered, the officer returned, and left only a servant with us to receive our answer. Consulting hereupon amongst ourselves, we were much perplexed. The denial of landing and hasty warning us away troubled us much. On the other side, to find that the people had languages and were so full of humanity did comfort us not a little. And above all, the sign of the cross to that instrument was to us a great rejoicing, and as it were a certain presage of good. Our answer was in the Spanish tongue, that for our ship it was well for we had rather met with calms and contrary winds than any tempests. For our sick they were many, and in very ill case, so that if they were not permitted to land they ran danger of their lives. Our other wants we set down in particular, adding that we had some little store of merchandise which if it pleased them to deal for, it might supply our wants, without being chargeable unto them. We offered some reward in pistolets unto the servant, and a piece of crimson velvet to be presented to the officer, but the servant took them not, nor would scarce look upon them, and so left us, and went back in another little boat which was sent for him. About three hours after we had dispatched our answer there came towards us a person, as it seemed, of place. He had on him a gown with wide sleeves of a kind of water chamolet, of an excellent azure colour, fair more glossy than ours. His under-apparel was green, and so was his hat, being in the form of a turban, daintily made, and not so huge as the Turkish turbans. And the locks of his hair came down below the brims of it. A reverend man was he to behold. He came in a boat, gilt in some part of it, with four persons more only in that boat, and was followed by another boat, wherein were some twenty. When he was come within a flight-shot of our ship, signs were made to us that we should send forth some to meet him upon the water, which we presently did in our ship-boat, sending the principal man amongst us save one, and four of our number with him. When we were come within six yards of their boat they called to us to stay, and not to approach farther, which we did, and thereupon the man whom I before described stood up, and with a loud voice in Spanish asked, Are ye Christians? We answered we were, fearing the less, because of the cross we had seen in the subscription. At which answer the said person lifted up his right hand towards heaven, and drew it softly to his mouth, which is the gesture they use when they thank God. And then said, If ye will swear, all of you, by the merits of the Saviour, that ye are no pirates, nor have shed blood, lawfully nor unlawfully, within forty days past, you may have license to come on land. We said, We were all ready to take that oath. 
Whereupon one of those that were with him, being as it seemed a notary, made an entry of this act. Which done, another of the attendants of the great person which was with him in the same boat, after his lord had spoken a little to him, said aloud, My lord would have you know, that it is not of pride or greatness that he cometh not aboard your ship, but for that in your answer you declare that you have many sick amongst you, he was warned by the conservator of health of the city that he should keep a distance. We bowed ourselves towards him, and answered we were his humble servants, and accounted for great honour and singular humanity towards us, that which was already done, but hoped well that the nature of the sickness of our men was not infectious. So he returned, and a while after came the notary to us aboard our ship, holding in his hand a fruit of that country, like an orange, but of colour between orange tawny and scarlet, which cast a most excellent odour. He used it, as it seemeth, for a preservative against infection. He gave us our oath. By the name of Jesus, and his merits and after told us that the next day, by six of the clock of the morning, we should be sent to, and brought to the stranger's house, so he called it, where we should be accommodated of things, both for our whole and for our sick. So he left us, and when we offered him some pistolets, he smiling said, He must not be twice paid for one labour, meaning, as I take it, that he had salary sufficient of the state for his service for, as I after learned, they call an officer that taketh rewards twice paid. The next morning early there came to us the same officer that came to us at first with his cane, and told us he came to conduct us to the stranger's house, and that he had prevented the hour because we might have the whole day before us for our business. For, said he, if you will follow my advice, there shall first go with me some few of you and see the place, and how it may be made convenient for you. And then you may send for your sick, and the rest of your number which ye will bring on land." We thanked him, and said, that this care which he took of desolate strangers God would reward. And so six of us went on land with him, and when we were on land, he went before us, and turned to us, and said, He was but our servant, and our guide. He led us through three fair streets and all the way we went there were gathered some people on both sides standing in a row, but in so civil a fashion, as if it had been not to wonder at us, but to welcome us, and divers of them, as we passed by them, put their arms a little abroad, which is their gesture when they did bid any welcome. The stranger's house is a fair and spacious house, built of brick, of somewhat a bluer colour than our brick, and with handsome windows, some of glass, some of a kind of cambric oiled. He brought us first into a fair parlour above stairs, and then asked us, What number of persons we were, and how many sick? We answered, We were in all, sick and whole, one and fifty persons, whereof our sick were seventeen. He desired us to have patience a little, and to stay till he came back to us, which was about an hour after, and then he led us to see the chambers which were provided for us, being in number nineteen, they having cast it, as it seemeth, that four of those chambers, which were better than the rest, might receive four of the principal men of our company, and lodge them alone by themselves, and the other fifteen chambers were to lodge us two and two together. The chambers were handsome and cheerful chambers, and furnished civilly. Then he led us to a long gallery, like a dorture, where he showed us all along the one side, for the other side was but wall and window, seventeen cells, very neat ones, having partitions of cedar wood, which gallery and cells, being in all forty, many more than we needed, were instituted as an infirmary for sick persons, and he told us withal that as any of our sick waxed well, he might be removed from his cell to a chamber, for which purpose there were set forth ten spare chambers, besides the number we spake of before. This done, he brought us back to the parlour, and lifting up his cane a little, as they do when they give any charge or command, said to us, Ye are to know, that the custom of the land requireth, that after this day and to-morrow, which we give you for removing your people from your ship, you are to keep within doors for three days. But let it not trouble you, 
nor do not think yourselves restrained, but rather left to your rest and ease. You shall want nothing, and there are six of our people appointed to attend you for any business you may have abroad. We gave him thanks, with all affection and respect, and said, God surely is manifested in this land. We offered him also twenty pistolets, but he smiled, and only said, What, twice paid? And so he left us. Soon after our dinner was served in, which was right good viands both for bread and treat, better than any collegiate diet that I have known in Europe. We had also drink of three sorts, all wholesome and good, wine of the grape, such as is with us our ale, but more clear, and a kind of cider made of a fruit of that country, a wonderful pleasing and refreshing drink. Besides, there were brought in to us great store of those scarlet oranges for our sick, which, they said, were an assured remedy for sickness taken at sea. There was given us also a box of small grey or whitish pills, which they wished our sick should take, one of the pills, every night before sleep, which, they said, would hasten their recovery. The next day, after that our trouble of carriage and removing of our men and goods out of our ship, was somewhat settled and quiet, I thought good to call our company together, and when they were assembled, said unto them, My dear friends, let us know ourselves, and how it standeth with us. We are men cast on land, as Jonas was out of the whale's belly, when we were as buried in the deep. And now we are on land, we are but between death and life, for we are beyond both the old world and the new. Whether ever we shall see Europe, God only knoweth. It is a kind of miracle hath brought us hither, and it must be little less that shall bring us hence. Therefore, in regard of our deliverance past, and our danger present, and to come, let us look up to God, and every man reform his own ways. Besides, we are come here amongst a Christian people, full of piety and humanity. Let us not bring that confusion of face upon ourselves, as to show our vices or unworthiness before them. Yet there is more, for they have by commandment, though in form of courtesy, cloistered us within these walls, for three days. Who knoweth whether it be not to take some taste of our manners and conditions? And if they find them bad, to banish us straightways, if good, to give us further time. For these men that they have given us for attendance may withal have an eye upon us. Therefore, for God's love, and as we love the weal of our souls and bodies, let us so behave ourselves, as we may be at peace with God, and may find grace in the eyes of this people. Our company with one voice thanked me for my good admonition, and promised me to live soberly and civilly, and without giving any the least occasion of offence. So we spent our three days joyfully, and without care, in expectation what would be done with us when they were expired during which time we had every hour joy of the amendment of our sick, who thought themselves cast into some divine pool of healing. They mended so kindly, and so fast. End of section 1. Recording by Bill Borst. Section 2 of The New Atlantis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The New Atlantis by Francis Bacon Section 2 During which time we had every hour joy of the amendment of our sick, who thought themselves cast into some divine pool of healing, they mended so kindly and so fast. The morrow after our three days were past, there came to us a new man that we had not seen before clothed in blue as the former was, save that his turban was white, with a small red cross on the top. He had also a tippet of fine linen. At his coming in he did bend to us a little, and put his arms abroad. We of our parts saluted him in a very lowly and submissive manner, as looking that from him we should receive sentence of life or death. He desired to speak with some few of us, whereupon six of us only stayed and the rest avoided the room. He said, I am by office governor of this house of strangers, and by vocation I am a Christian priest, 
and therefore am come to you to offer you my service both as strangers and chiefly as Christians. Some things I may tell you which I think you will not be unwilling to hear. The State hath given you license to stay on land for the space of six weeks, and let it not trouble you if your occasions ask further time, for the law in this point is not precise, and I do not doubt but myself shall be able to obtain for you such further time as may be convenient. Ye shall also understand that the stranger's house is at this time rich, and much aforehand, for it hath laid up revenue these thirty-seven years, for so long it is since any stranger arrived in this part. And therefore take ye no care, the State will defray you all the time you stay, neither shall you stay one day the less for that. As for any merchandise ye have brought, ye shall be well used, and have your return, either in merchandise or in gold and silver, for to us it is all one. And if you have any other request to make, hide it not, for ye shall find we will not make your countenance to fall by the answer ye shall receive. Only this I must tell you, that none of you must go above a karen, that is, that is with them a mile and a half, from the walls of the city, without a special leave. We answered, after we had looked a while one upon another, admiring this gracious and parent-like usage, that we could not tell what to say, for we wanted words to express our thanks, and his noble free offers left us nothing to ask. It seemed to us that we had before us a picture of our salvation in heaven, for we that were a while since in the jaws of death were now brought into a place where we found nothing but consolations. For the commandment laid upon us we would not fail to obey it, though it was impossible but our hearts should be inflamed to tread further upon this happy and holy ground. We added that our tongues should first cleave to the roofs of our mouths, ere we should forget either his reverend person or this whole nation in our prayers. We also most humbly besought him to accept of us as his true servants, by as just a right as ever men on earth were bounden, laying and presenting both our persons and all we had at his feet. He said he was a priest, and looked for a priest's reward, which was our brotherly love, and the good of our souls and bodies. So he went from us, not without tears of tenderness in his eyes, and left us also confused with joy and kindness, saying amongst ourselves that we were come into a land of angels, which did appear to us daily, and prevent us with comforts which we thought not of, much less expected. The next day, about ten of the clock, the governor came to see us again, and after salutations said familiarly that he was come to visit us, and called for a chair, and sat him down and we, being some ten of us, the rest were of the meaner sort, or else gone abroad, sat down with him, and when we were set, he began thus. We of this island of Bensalem, for so they call it in their language, have this, that by means of our solitary situation, and of the laws of secrecy which we have for our travellers, and our rare admission of strangers, we know well most part of the habitable world, and are ourselves unknown. Therefore, because he that knoweth least is fittest to ask questions, it is more reason for the entertainment of the time that ye ask me questions than that I ask you. We answered that we humbly thanked him that he would give us leave so to do, and that we conceived by the taste we had already that there was no worldly thing on earth more worthy to be known than the state of that happy land. But above all, we said, since that we were met from the several ends of the world, and hoped assuredly that we should meet one day in the kingdom of heaven, for that we were both parts Christians, we desired to know, in respect that land was so remote and so divided by vast and unknown seas from the land where our Saviour walked on earth, who was the apostle of that nation, and how it was converted to the faith. It appeared in his face that he took great contentment in this our question. He said, ye knit my heart to you by asking this question in the first place, for it sheweth that you first seek the kingdom of heaven, and I shall gladly and briefly satisfy your demand. About twenty years after the ascension of our Saviour, it came to pass that there was seen by the people of Renfusa, a city upon the eastern coast of our island, within night, the night was cloudy and calm, 
as it might be some mile into the sea, a great pillar of light, not sharp, but in form of a column or cylinder rising from the sea a great way up towards heaven, and on the top of it was seen a large cross of light, more bright and resplendent than the body of the pillar, upon which so strange a spectacle the people of the city gathered apace together upon the sands to wonder and so after put themselves into a number of small boats to go nearer to this marvellous sight. But when the boats were come within about sixty yards of the pillar, they found themselves all bound, and could go no further. Yet so as they might move to go about, but might not approach nearer, so as the boats stood all as in a theatre, beholding this light as an heavenly sign, it so fell out that there was in one of the boats one of the wise men, of the society of Salomon's house, which house or college, my good brethren, is the very eye of this kingdom, who having a while attentively and devoutly viewed and contemplated this pillar and cross, fell down upon his face, and then raised himself upon his knees, and lifting up his hands to heaven, made his prayers in this manner. Lord God of heaven and earth, thou hast vouchsafed of thy grace to those of our order, to know thy works of creation, and the secrets of them, and to discern, as far as appertaineth to the generations of men, between divine miracles, works of nature, works of art, and impostures, and illusions of all sorts. I do here acknowledge and testify before this people, that the thing which we now see before our eyes is thy finger and a true miracle. And forasmuch as we learn in our books that thou never workest miracles but to divine and excellent end, for the laws of nature are thine own laws, and thou exceedest them not but upon great cause, we most humbly beseech thee to prosper this great sign, and to give us the interpretation and use of it in mercy, which thou dost in some part secretly promise by sending it unto us. When he had made his prayer, he presently found the boat he was in movable, and unbound, whereas all the rest remained still fast. And taking that for an assurance of leave to approach, he caused the boat to be softly and with silence rowed towards the pillar. But ere he came near it, the pillar and cross of light break up, and cast itself abroad, as it were, into a firmament of many stars, which also vanished soon after and there was nothing left to be seen but a small ark, or chest of cedar, dry, and not wet at all with water, though it swam. And in the fore end of it which was towards him grew a small green branch of palm. And when the wise man had taken it, with all reverence into his boat, it opened of itself, and there were found in it a book and a letter, both written in fine parchment, and wrapped up in sindons of linen. The book contained all the canonical books of the Old and New Testament, according as you have them, for we know well what the churches with you receive, and the Apocalypse itself, and some other books of the New Testament, which were not at that time written, were nevertheless in the book, and for the letter it was in these words, I, Bartholomew, a servant of the Highest and Apostle of Jesus Christ, was warned by an angel that appeareth to me in a vision of glory that I should commit this ark to the floods of the sea. Therefore I do testify and declare unto that people where God shall ordain this ark to come to land, that in the same day is come unto them salvation, and peace, and good will, from the Father, and from the Lord Jesus. There was also in both these writings, as well the book as the letter, wrought a great miracle conformed to that of the apostles, in the original gift of tongues for there being at that time in this land Hebrews, Persians, and Indians, besides the natives, every one read upon the book and letter, as if they had been written in his own language. And thus was this land saved from infidelity, as the remainder of the old world was from water, by an ark, through the apostolical and miraculous evangelism of St. Bartholomew. And here he paused, and a messenger came and called him from us, so this was all that passed in that conference. The next day the same governor came again to us, immediately after dinner, and excused himself, saying, that the day before he was called from us, somewhat abruptly, but now he would make us amends, and spend time with us, if we held his company and conference agreeable. 
we answered that we held it so agreeable and pleasing to us as we forgot both dangers past and fears to come for the time we hear him speak and that we thought an hour spent with him was worth years of our former life he bowed himself a little to us and after we were set again he said well the questions are in your part one of our number said after a little pause that there was a matter we were no less desirous to know than fearful to ask lest we might presume too far but encouraged by his rare humanity towards us that could scarce think ourselves strangers being his vowed and professed servants we would take the hardiness to propound it humbly beseeching him if he thought it was not fit to be answered that he would pardon it though he rejected it we said we well observed those his words which he formerly spake that this happy island where we now stood was known to few and yet knew most of the nations of the world which we found to be true considering they had the languages of europe and knew much of our state and business and yet we in europe notwithstanding all the remote discoveries and navigations of this last age never heard of the least inkling or glimpse of this island this we found wonderful strange for that all nations have interknowledge one of another either by voyage into foreign parts or by strangers that come to them and though the traveller into a foreign country doth commonly know more by the eye than he that stayeth at home can by relation of the traveller yet both ways suffice to make a mutual knowledge in some degree on both parts before this island we never heard tell of any ship of theirs that had been seen to arrive upon any shore of europe nor of either the east or west indies nor yet of any ship of any other part of the world that had made return from them and yet the marvel rested not in this for the situation of it as his lordship said in the secret conclave of such a vast sea might cause it but then that they should have knowledge of the languages books affairs of those that lie such a distance from them it was a thing we could not tell what to make of for that it seemed to us a conditioner and propriety of divine powers and beings to be hidden and unseen to others and yet to have others open and as in a light to them at this speech the governor gave a gracious smile and said that we did well to ask pardon for this question we now asked for that it imported as if we thought this land a land of magicians that set forth spirits of the air into all parts to bring them news and intelligence of other countries it was answered by us all in all possible humbleness but yet with a countenance taking knowledge that we knew that he spake it but merrily that we were apt enough to think that there was somewhat supernatural in this island but yet rather as angelical than magical but to let his lordship know truly what it was that made us tender and doubtful to ask this question it was not any such conceit but because we remembered he had given a touch in his former speech that this land had laws of secrecy touching strangers to this he said you remember it aright and therefore in that i shall say to you which it is not lawful for me to reveal but there will be enough left to give you satisfaction you shall understand that which perhaps you will scarce think credible that about three thousand years ago or somewhat more the navigation of the world especially for remote voyages was greater than at this day do not think with yourselves that i know not how much of it is increased with you within these sixscore years i know it well and yet i say greater then than now whether it was that the example of the ark that saved the remnant of men from the universal deluge gave men confidence to adventure upon the waters or what it was but such is the truth the phoenicians and especially the tyrians had great fleets so had the carthaginians their colony which is yet further west toward the east the shipping of egypt and of palestine was likewise great china also and the great atlantis that you call america which have now but junks and canoes abounded then in tall ships this island as appeareth by faithful registers of those times had then fifteen hundred strong ships of great content of all this there is with you sparing memory or none but we have large knowledge thereof at that time this land was known and frequented by the ships and vessels of all the nations before named and as it cometh to pass 
They had many times men of other countries that were no sailors, that came with them, as Persians, Chaldeans, Arabians, so as almost all nations of might and fame resorted hither, of whom we have some stirps and little tribes with us at this day, and for our own ships they went sundry voyages, as well as to your straits, which you call the Pillars of Hercules, as to other parts in the Atlantic and Mediterranean seas. As to Paguin, which is the same with Cambeline, and Quincy, upon the Oriental seas, as far as to the borders of the East Tartary. At the same time, and an age after, or more, the inhabitants of the great Atlantis did flourish. For though the narration and description which is made by a great man with you, that the descendants of Neptune planted there, and of the magnificent temple, palace, city, and hill, and the manifold streams of goodly navigable rivers, which as so many chains environed the same site and temple, and the several degrees of ascent, whereby men did climb up to the same, as if it had been a scala coeli, be all poetical and fabulous. Yet so much is true, that the said country of Atlantis, as well as that of Peru, then called Coya, as that of Mexico, then named Tyrambel, were mighty and proud kingdoms in arms, shipping, and riches. So mighty, as at one time, or at least within the space of ten years, they both made two great expeditions. They of Tyrambel through the Atlantic to the Mediterranean Sea, and they of Coya through the South Sea upon this our island. And for the former of these, which was into Europe, the same author amongst you, as it seemeth, had some relation from the Egyptian priest whom he cited. End of section 2 Recording by Bill Borst Section 3 of The New Atlantis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The New Atlantis by Francis Bacon Section 3 and they of Coya through the South Sea upon this our island. And for the former of these which was into Europe, the same author amongst you, as it seemeth, had some relation from the Egyptian priest whom he cited. For assuredly such a thing there was. But whether it were the ancient Athenians that had the glory of the repulse and resistance of those forces, I can say nothing. But certain it is, there never came back either ship or man from that voyage. Neither had the other voyage of those Coya upon us had better fortune, if they had not met with enemies of greater clemency. For the king of this island, by name Altabin, a wise man and a great warrior, knowing well both his own strength and that of his enemies, handled the matter so as he cut off their land forces from their ships, and entoiled both their navy and their tamp with a greater power than theirs, both by sea and land arid compelled them to render themselves without striking stroke, and after they were at his mercy, contenting himself only with their oath that they should no more bear arms against him, dismissed them all in safety. But the divine revenge overtook not long after those proud enterprises. For within less than the space of one hundred years the great Atlantis was utterly lost and destroyed. Not by a great earthquake, as your man saith, for that whole tract is little subject to earthquakes, but by a particular deluge or inundation, those countries having at this day far greater rivers and far higher mountains to pour down waters than any part of the old world. But it is true that the same inundation was not deep, not past forty foot, in most places, from the ground, so that, although it destroyed man and beast generally, yet some few wild inhabitants of the wood escaped. Birds also were saved by flying to the high trees and woods. For as for men, although they had buildings in many places higher than the depth of the water, yet that inundation, though it were shallow, had a long continuance, whereby they of the vale that were not drowned perished for want of food and other things necessary. So as marvel you not at the thin population of America, nor at the rudeness and ignorance of the people, for you must account your inhabitants of America as a young people, younger a thousand years at the least than the rest of the world. 
for that there was so much time between the universal flood and their particular inundation. For the poor remnant of human seed, which remained in their mountains, peopled the country again slowly, by little and little, and being simple and savage people, not like Noah and his sons, which was the chief family of the earth, they were not able to leave letters, arts, and civility to their posterity, and having likewise in their mountainous habitations been used, in respect of the extreme cold of these regions, to clothe themselves with the skins of tigers, bears, and great hairy goats, that they have in those parts, when after they came down into the valley, and found the intolerable heats which are there, and knew no means of lighter apparel, they were forced to begin the custom of going naked, which continueth at this day. Only they take great pride and delight in the feathers of birds, and this also they took from those their ancestors of the mountains, who were invited unto it by the infinite flights of birds that came up to the high grounds, while the waters stood below. So you see, by this main accident of time, we lost our traffic with the Americans, with whom of all others in regard they lay nearest to us, we had most commerce. As for the other parts of the world, it is most manifest that in the ages following, whether it were in respect of wars or by a natural revolution of time, navigation did everywhere greatly decay, and specially far voyages, the rather by the use of galleys and such vessels as could hardly brook the ocean, were altogether left and omitted. So then, that part of intercourse which could be from other nations to sail to us, you see how it hath long since ceased, except it were by some rare accident as this of yours. But now of the cessation of that other part of intercourse, which might be by our sailing to other nations, I must yield you some other cause, for I cannot say, if I shall say truly, but our shipping for number, strength, mariners, pilots, and all things that appertain to navigation, is as great as ever. And therefore, why we should sit at home, I shall now give you an account by itself, and it will draw nearer to give you satisfaction to your principal question. There reigned in this land about nineteen hundred years ago a king whose memory of all others we most adore, not superstitiously but as a divine instrument, though a mortal man. His name was Solomona, and we esteem him as the lawgiver of our nation. This king had a large heart, inscrutable for good, and was wholly bent to make his kingdom and people happy. He therefore, taking into consideration how sufficient and substantive this land was to maintain itself without any aid at all of the foreigner, being five thousand six hundred miles in circuit, and of rare fertility of soil in the greatest part thereof, and finding also the shipping of this country might be plentifully set on work, both by fishing and by transportations from port to port, and likewise by sailing unto some small islands that are not far from us and are under the crown and laws of this state, and, recalling into his memory the happy and flourishing estate wherein this land then was, so as it might be a thousand ways altered to the worse, but scarce any one way to the better, thought nothing wanted to his noble and heroical intentions, but only, as far as human foresight might reach, to give perpetuity to that which was in his time so happily established. Therefore, amongst his other fundamental laws of this kingdom, he did ordain the interdicts and prohibitions which we have touching entrance of strangers, which at that time, though it was after the calamity of America, was frequent, doubting novelties and commixture of manners. It is true, the like law against the admission of strangers without license is an ancient law in the kingdom of China, and yet continued in use. But there it is a poor thing and hath made them a curious, ignorant, fearful, foolish nation. But our lawgiver made his law of another temper, for first he hath preserved all points of humanity, in taking order and making provision for the relief of strangers distressed, whereof you have tasted. At which speech, as reason was, we all rose up and bowed ourselves. He went on. That king also, still desiring to join humanity and policy together, and thinking it against humanity to detain strangers here against their wills, and against policy that they should return and discover their knowledge of this estate, he took this course. 
he did ordain that of the strangers that should be permitted to land as many at all times might depart as would but as many as would stay should have very good conditions and means to live from the state wherein he saw so far that now in so many ages since the prohibition we have memory not of one ship that ever returned and but of thirteen persons only at several times that chose to return in our bottoms what those few that returned may have reported abroad i know not but you must think whatsoever they have said could be taken where they came but for a dream now for our travelling from henna into parts abroad our lawgiver thought fit altogether to restrain it so is it not in china for the chinese sail where they will or can which sheweth that their law of keeping out strangers is a law of pusillanimity and fear but this restraint of ours hath one only exception which is admirable preserving the good which cometh by communicating with strangers and avoiding the hurt and i will now open it to you and here i shall seem a little to digress but you will by and by find it pertinent ye shall understand my dear friends that amongst the excellent acts of that king one above all hath the pre-eminence it was the erection and institution of an order or society which we call salomon's house the noblest foundation as we think that ever was upon the earth and the lanthorn of this kingdom it is dedicated to the study of the works and creatures of god some think it beareth the founder's name a little corrupted as if it should be solomona's house but the records write it as it is spoken so as i take it to be denominate of the king of the hebrews which is famous with you and no stranger to us for we have some parts of his works which with you are lost namely that natural history which he wrote of all plants from the cedar of libanus to the moss that groweth out of the wall and of all things that have life and motion this maketh me think that our king finding himself to symbolize in many things with that king of the hebrews which lived many years before him honoured him with the title of this foundation and i am rather induced to be of this opinion for that i find in ancient records this order or society is sometimes called salomon's house and sometimes the college of the six days works whereby i am satisfied that our excellent king had learned from the hebrews that god had created the world and all that therein is within six days and therefore he instituting that house for the finding out of the true nature of all things whereby god might have the more glory in the workmanship of them and insert the more fruit in the use of them did give it also that second name but now to come to our present purpose when the king had forbidden to all his people navigation into any part that was not under his crown he made nevertheless this ordinance that every twelve years there should be set forth out of this kingdom two ships appointed to several voyages that in either of these ships there should be a mission of three of the fellows or brethren of salomon's house whose errand was only to give us knowledge of the affairs and state of those countries to which they were designed and especially of the sciences arts manufactures and inventions of all the world and withal to bring unto us books instruments and patterns in every kind that the ships after they had landed the brethren should return and that the brethren should stay abroad till the new mission these ships are not otherwise fraught than with store of victuals and good quantity of treasure to remain with the brethren for the buying of such things and rewarding of such persons as they should think fit now for me to tell you how the vulgar sort of mariners are contained from being discovered at land and how they that must be put on shore for any time colour themselves under the names of other nations and to what places these voyages have been designed and what places of rendezvous are appointed for the new missions and the like circumstances of the practique i may not do it neither is it much to your desire but thus you see we maintain a trade not for gold silver or jewels nor for silks nor for spices nor any other commodity of matter but only for god's first creature which was light to have light i say of the growth of all parts of the world and when he had said this he was silent and so were we all for indeed we were all astonished to hear so strange things so probably told and he 
perceiving that we were willing to say somewhat, but had it not ready in great courtesy, took us off, and descended to ask us questions of our voyage and fortunes, and in the end concluded that we might do well to think with ourselves what time of stay we would demand of the state, and bade us not to scant ourselves, for he would procure such time as we desired. Whereupon we all rose up, and presented ourselves to kiss the skirt of his tippet. But he would not suffer us, and so took his leave. But when it came once amongst our people that the State used to offer conditions to strangers that would stay, we had work enough to get any of our men to look to our ship, and to keep them from going presently to the Governor to crave conditions. But with much ado we refrained them, till we might agree what course to take. We took ourselves now for free men, seeing there was no danger of our utter perdition, and lived most joyfully, going abroad and seeing what there was to be seen, in the city and places adjacent within our tetter, and obtaining acquaintance with many of the city, not of the meanest quality, at whose hands we found such humanity and such a freedom and desire to take strangers, as it were, into their bosom, as was enough to make us forget all that was dear to us in our own countries and continually we met with many things right worthy of observation and relation, as indeed, if there be a mirror in the world worthy to hold men's eyes, it is that country. One day there were two of our company bidden to a feast of the family, as they call it. A most natural, pious, and reverend custom it is, shewing that nation to be compounded of all goodness. This is the manner of it. It is granted to any man that shall live to see thirty persons descended of his body alive together, and all above three years old, to make this feast which is done at the cost of the state. The father of the family whom they call the Tirsan, two days before the feast, taketh to him three of such friends as he liketh to choose, and is assisted also by the governor of the city or place where the feast is celebrated, and all the persons of the family of both sexes are summoned to attend him. These two days the Tirsan sitteth in consultation concerning the good estate of the family. There, if there be any discord or suits between any of the family, they are compounded and appeased. There, if any of the family be distressed or decayed, order is taken for their relief and competent means to live. There, if any be subject to vice or take ill courses, they are reproved and censured. So likewise direction is given touching marriages and the courses of life, which any of them should take, with diverse other the like orders and advices. The governor assisteth, to the end to put in execution by his public authority the decrees and orders of the Tirsan, if they should be disobeyed, though that seldom needeth. Such reverence and obedience they give to the order of nature. The Tirsan doth also then ever choose one man from among his sons to live in house with him, who is called ever after the son of the vine. The reason will hereafter appear. On the feast day the father or Tirsan cometh forth after divine service into a large room where the feast is celebrated, which room hath an half-pace at the upper end. Against the wall, in the middle of the half-pace, is a chair placed for him with a table and carpet before it. Over the chair is a state, made round or oval, and it is of ivy, an ivy somewhat whiter than ours, like the leaf of a silver asp, but more shining, for it is green all winter, and the state is curiously wrought with silver and silk of diverse colours, broiding or binding in the ivy, and is ever the work of some of the daughters of the family, and veiled over at the top with a fine net of silk and silver but the substance of it is true ivy, whereof, after it is taken down, the friends of the family are desirous to have some leaf or sprig to keep. The Tirsan cometh forth with all his generation or lineage, the males before him, and the females following him. And if there be a mother from whose body the whole lineage is descended, there is a traverse placed in a loft above on the right hand of the chair, with a privy door, and a carved window of glass, leaded with gold and blue, where she sitteth, but is not seen. End of section 3 Recording by Bill Borst Section 4 of The New Atlantis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The New Atlantis by Francis Bacon Section 4 And if there be a mother from whose body the whole lineage is descended, there is a traverse placed in a loft above on the right hand of the chair with a privy door, and a carved window of glass, leaded with gold and blue, where she sitteth but is not seen. When the Tirsan is come forth, he sitteth down in the chair, and all the lineage place themselves against the wall, both at his back and upon the return of the half-pace, in order of their years without difference of sex, and stand upon their feet. When he is set, the room being always full of company, but well kept and without disorder, after some pause, there cometh in from the lower end of the room a tarotan, which is as much as an herald, and on either side of him two young lads, whereof one carrieth a scroll of their shining yellow parchment, and the other a cluster of grapes of gold, with a long foot or stalk. The herald and children are clothed with mantles of sea-water green satin, but the herald's mantle is streamed with gold and hath a train. Then the herald, with three curtsies, or rather inclinations, cometh up as far as the half-pace, and there first taketh into his hand the scroll. This scroll is the king's charter, containing gifts of revenue, and many privileges, exemptions, and points of honour, granted to the father of the family, and is ever styled and directed, to such do one our well-beloved friend and creditor, which is a title proper only to this case. For they say the king is debtor to no man, but for propagation of his subjects. The seal set to the king's charter is the king's image, embossed or moulded in gold, and though such charters be expedited of course, and as of right, yet they are varied by discretion according to the number and dignity of the family. This charter the herald readeth aloud, and while it is read the father or Tirsan standeth up supported by two of his sons, such as he chooseth. Then the herald mounteth the half-pace, and delivereth the charter into his hand, and with that there is an acclamation by all that are present, in their language, which is thus much, Happy are the people of Bensalem. Then the herald taketh into his hand from the other child the cluster of grapes, which is of gold, both the stalk and the grapes. But the grapes are daintily enamelled, and if the males of the family be the greater number, the grapes are enamelled purple, with a little sun set on the top. If the females, then they are enamelled into a greenish-yellow, with a crescent on the top. The grapes are in number as many as there are descendants of the family. This golden cluster the herald delivereth also to the Tirsan, who presently delivereth it over to that son that he had formerly chosen to be in house with him, who beareth it before his father as an ensign of honour when he goeth in public, ever after, and is thereupon called the son of the vine. After the ceremony endeth, the father or Tirsan retireth, and after some time cometh forth again to dinner, where he sitteth alone under the state as before, and none of his descendants sit with him, of what degree or dignity soever, except he hap to be of Salomon's house. He is served only by his own children, such as are male, who perform unto him all service of the table upon the knee. And the women only stand about him, leaning against the wall. The room below the half-pace hath tables on the sides for the guests that are bidden, who are served with great and comely order, which in the greatest feasts with them lasteth never above an hour and an half. There is an hymn sung, varied according to the invention of him that composeth it, for they have excellent poesy, but the subject of it is, always, the praises of Adam and Noah and Abraham whereof the former two peopled the world, and the last was the father of the faithful, concluding ever with a thanksgiving for the nativity